I welcome you all on behalf of the Bangladesh Working Group on External Debt to this global online seminar with a focus on Bangladesh. Um, this is organized by, of course, the BWGED with the Democratic Budget Movement, DBM, JAXIS, the Japan Center for Sustainable Environment and Society, and your forum on ADB and Orge <coughs> We're of course going to talk of external debt, energy, <coughs> and the prospect of economic recovery in Bangladesh, something that is occupying most um, Bangladeshi's minds. But um, it's also um, friends of Bangladesh, supporters of the Bangladesh Working Group and BBM, who really come together because this, they feel, is a time to. Um, sort of introspect to reflect uh, together with uh, a supportive global community and to sort of collate ideas. We are not going to sort of think of a campaign that we need to do right away, but we're going to sort of um, listen to ideas, um, discuss, and then perhaps, um, uh, you know, plan the way ahead. So for this, we have, um, first of all, Hassan Mehdi, who will, uh, lead us with um, a kind of uh, opening remarks. He's the member secretary of the BWGD. And then we'll have keynote presenter Monover Mustafa, an economist and the convener of the Bangladesh Working Group on External Debt and general secretary of the Democratic Budget Movement, who will give us the keynote address for about 10 minutes. Um, no more than 10 minutes, Monover. And then we have our guest speakers who get only five minutes. So on the first round, you have Yuki Tanabe who will lead. Um, and then uh, he's the director of JAXIS. He's also an IC member of the NGO Forum on Sinologists with Orgewald in Germany, who also has her five minutes. Ryan Hassan, executive director with the NGO Forum on ADB in the Philippines. Siddharth Akali, Executive Director for the Coalition for Human Rights and Development. Also five minutes. After that, we open it up for uh, an easy um, and open discussion for 30 minutes, uh, in which we will ask uh, people to turn on their mics just at that time, speak very briefly, um, whether it's a reflection or a question. And then we'll have closing remarks also by Hassan Mehdi. Um, we have our two rapporteurs, Kuntal and Tuhin, who will be um, reporting for us. And we are also, of course, on, um, uh, on Facebook, live streaming. I'll hand over uh, to Mehdi right away, if he can unmute his mic and, um, you know, start with the opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vidya. Uh, I'm going to... Uh, very small presentation from me because uh, is it okay? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome everybody here. Uh, uh, you you managed some. Screen. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to. So thank you very much and uh, welcome uh, to the online seminar on external debt, energy, and prospects of economy in Bangladesh. Uh, and thank you everybody to manage some time in this uh, busy online meeting everywhere and uh, in that, that you managed a little bit time for us. Uh, only after nine days, uh, the finance minister of Bangladesh is going to present uh, the national budget for 2021 fiscal, fiscal year on uh, 11 June 2020. Uh, the budget of this fiscal year may cross uh, around uh, $66.27 billion. Uh, which is only 5% higher than the last year, of, uh, last fiscal year. Last fiscal year budget was $63.03 .03 billion. And the average, uh, but uh, although the average uh, growth of budget in, in, the, in Bangladesh is 15.5% uh, every year since 2000. So uh, this is the uh, present. Uh, is it going? No. Okay, uh, so uh, before the budget, government uh, uh, applied for uh, several uh, more than $2 billion to the 
development partners, including the IFIs, ADB, AIIB, World Bank, and IMF. And the government got uh, uh, 1,807 uh, billion dollar, million dollar. Uh, among those, uh, 1,765.33 million is loan and 17.84 million is uh, grant uh, from ADB, AIB, AIMF, and World Bank. And this, uh, in this situation, government has to pay around $410 million per month to the independent, quick rental, and rental power plants. Recently, the Minister of Power, Energy, and Mineral Resources boldly said that the government is ready to give unsolicited approval to any amount of renewable energy if the company is capable for, of financing. We should take note of that and try to start a proactive campaign also. Bangladesh Working Group is going to trying to conduct a study on potential of renewables in the country. Uh, actually, like uh, Ignis the popular myths, Ignis the renewable. Uh, that's uh, we we have been taken an initiative. We have taken an initiative for that. Uh, in in this COVID period, three uh, Bangladesh Working Group members jointly wrote an article on National Daily. Uh, a newspaper about uh, economic aspects of COVID-19, including issues of energy, uh, health, uh, and livelihoods. Uh, we circulated and submit a statement to all bilateral and multilateral institutes to cancel realizing installments of debt, their debt for at least 2021 period. Uh, the initiative has been taken jointly by Bangladesh Working Group, Campaign for Sustainable uh, uh, Rural Livelihoods, CSRL, Food Security Director Khani, Life and Nature Safeguard Platform, LNSP, and NGO Forum and ADP. We have organized a meeting of uh, Bangladesh Working Group uh, members on 30th April 2020 uh, on the in, in energy situation during COVID-19 uh, with participation of 80, 28 members. Uh, we have supported affected people of Bola IPP and Borishal Core Power Plant area uh, with our limited capacity. Other Bangladesh Working Group members also supported in uh, different areas. Uh, it's the third meeting, you know, uh, after uh, 2nd January and uh, 30th April 2020. This meeting is jointly organized by Democratic Budget Movement uh, with uh, Bangladesh Working Group on External Debt. Democratic Budget Movement, which is the leading organization of Bangladesh working on financial accountability. Japan Center for Sustainable Environment and Society, JAXES, one of the leading organizations for advocacy with Japan government and Financial Institutes, uh, NGO Forum and ADB, the Asian Watchdog of ADB and AIIB, and Urge World, which is, has been working closely with Bangladesh MP Coal Campaign since Fulbari Coal Movement. So far, 85 uh, persons have been registered, uh, have registered uh, to participate the, in the seminar. Among them, 38 participants from Bangladesh and 47 are from uh, different 40, 14 countries. Uh, the seminar uh, duration is estimated as uh, one, uh, one hour, 15 minutes. So please consider uh, the time. And thank you all friends and colleagues who allocate your valuable time for us. Uh, we are uh, warmly, heartily uh, uh, welcoming you to the, uh, everybody in the online seminar. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mehdi. We will now ask their um, convener. Monover Mustafa to give us um, a kind of keynote to kickstart. Let's and so um, we'll keep it short. But Monover, you have ten minutes. Very good afternoon to all of you. I'm proud, proud to be here to present something to you. I'll be moving a little fast because it's a vast issue, but I have to complete everything by ten minutes. So uh, <clears throat> today's discussion is external debt, energy and prospect for economic recovery in Bangladesh. So each and every country is thinking about their economic recovery after post COVID-19. So in today's discussion, I will touch upon the following issues, the impact of Corona virus on, or on, on our national economy, state of external debt, external debt in energy sector, energy sector and our national budget and con some considerations for debate and discussion. Let us come to the <coughs> economic area, national economic arena. As we know, this is, this, is, this is true to each and every country that 
whole the global GDP will go down. So it's very natural. Bangladesh GDP will go down. It was it was estimated to be 8.2 for this current fiscal year, but it will come down to 3% as predicted by many organizations, <coughs> including our government. So the, during this period, the worst victim are the export, the import, and the remittances. There are still a jobless, job loss, particularly in the informal sector. That informal sector comprised of 85 percent of the whole, you uh, uh, know, <coughs> economy. And there will be shrinking fiscal space, so it will be very difficult on part of the government to collect taxes. So there will be very low level of tax collection, and increasing domestic and foreign borrowing will go up. Uh, simply because of the shrinking fiscal space. And our revenue target is normally, in a country like Bangladesh, revenue target increases on an average 10% every year. But this time, government has set a target to increase it by 1.35% only. And there are many more implications. I'm not going deep into that matter to consume the time. So these are the major uh, areas of concern that our, that our economy is moving around. <clears throat> and what about the external debt? I will not pay. I will not spend so much time on this issue. So these are the ex state of external debt in Bangladesh. This is just outstanding debt. Uh, it has it has gone from you know like these are the la last five years uh, state of external debt. This is outstanding external debt <clears throat> in million million dollars. So our debt GDP ratio is kind of, it's, it's increasing from 13.5 to 14.7 now. However, our debt repayment ratio, uh, in terms of uh, repayment of external debt, Bangladesh is not in a bad position because our reputation and our performance is good. So in that terms, uh, we are not in debt country uh, anymore. However, uh, this is not the case. If you look at the uh, debt payment issue from the perspective of our economy and livelihood, there are so many social and economic costs that the country has to bear or is still bearing simply because of this interest payment of foreign uh, loans. So let us move to the. <coughs> so on an average, we pay three percent of our revenue income. I'm. I'm saying it again, it's revenue income. I mean the government income as interest payment for foreign public debt. So this is that what we need to keep in mind. And public sector loan in power sector is soaring up. Let's look at, look at the picture. So in 2015, it was just $590 million. Now it has come, it has gone up to 4,019. It's complete in power sector. As you have understood that uh, I'm moving from our national economy to focusing on energy sector. And I'll come to some conclusion uh, combining both. So this is the public sector loan in the energy sector. And let us have the private sector. The net FDI inflow, particularly in the far sector, looks like this. So this is, this, this, from this picture, we can draw something in mind. Let's look at the China bar. It's unbeatable, you know, like uncomparable in comparison to any other countries, especially it's the, it's the private, you know, like <coughs> FDI, foreign direct investment that are coming down in the uh, uh, power sector in Bangladesh. So this is the China that uh, China's Chinese private investment that requires special attention, especially for those who are working in the energy sector. And exactly what Chinese investments are doing, I mean, where it is being invested, those are the issues that need to be seriously taken into consideration, especially for those who are working for the coal, working against the coal power plant and, uh, and working for clean energy. Anyway, let's move to the next one. So it comes down to a 
very uh, related question of energy policy in Bangladesh. It has been in a desire even before the corona outbreak. Our energy policy was in a state of desire. The most significant characteristics of this, and our mis of, of this state of situation was like mismatch between supply and demand, meaning production capacity versus actual consumption. This is simply because of a policy failure. The second feature is overcapacity to produce while consuming less, resulting in soaring capacity charges paid to IPP, independent power plant owners. And this is what I call how public money goes to the private pockets. Let's come down something about the capacity charges. Capacity charge is simple, a sort of penalty that government has to bound to pay if it fails to buy a certain portion of power from the plant owners as stipulated in the purchase agreement. Purchase agreement are made between government and the private uh, plant owners. So this is, this, is, this is the penalty that government uh, has to uh, pay. And penalty is calculated on the basis of around 40% plant factor of the power plants. And as you know that uh, 40, at least 40% uh, plants, there must be at least 40% plant factor. Around now, it's around one third of overall power plants in Bangladesh sitting idle, counting capacity charges for a lack of the demand. Why lack of demand? There is an inflated electricity demand projected in our policy paper. And why that uh, inflated one? Simply because there is a strong presence of lobbyist groups surrounding our power business and an unscrupulous power entrepreneurs who insisted the government can uh, come up with, with that uh, inflated electricity demand. Our economy doesn't need that much electricity, but they are producing. And resulted in the installation of power plants having more than required demand and soaring capacity plants. So there are plenty of uh, power plants, uh, capacity to produce, but economy doesn't have that capacity to consume. That's the crux of the problem and we are in that uh, uh, odd position. So how much we are paying? It's in BDT. And this to BDT because just to conclude something. So it's now 89.29 billion Bangladesh shitaka. It's kind of 1.1 billion dollars perhaps. So it has gone up from 15, it was 50, now it has 89. And how does this 89 mean for us? This increasing trend of so-called capacity charge paying USD 1.1 billion, that is 89.26 uh, BDT billion annually, including various non-monetary incentives to IPP owners that we are giving. This 1.1 billion could have been utilized for financing the 5 million poor families during this period, paying each 118 monthly for two months or use the 59 for four months. That's what poor people, families need right at this moment. But government is giving just, uh, it would be kind of $25 or something uh, to the poor family, just uh, 5 million poor families, they are giving it to them. So this is the social cost of making illegitimate contacts. What I, the purchasing contact, I, I would rather say that these are illegitimate contacts with the power producing companies. And these are the social costs that we are bearing. And it has put tremendous pressure on budget, particularly in a time when fiscal space is shrinking drastically. And this is obviously a gross failure of our energy policy indeed. So right at this moment, right at this state of affairs, there are some serious concerns that we need to consider immediate. The first one is stop paying interest of foreign public debt for at least two, three years. That's the demand we have to make. It could be debated, it could be discussed in many forums, but we, we believe that Bangladesh is not in a position, economically not in a position to pay the interest of the foreign debt right at this moment. So we need some, you know, like holidays for, uh, to revive our economy. 
and please shut down unnecessary and old thought plans to reconcile the loss rather than raising the electricity price. Because that capacity charge, that 1.1 billion capacity charge the government has been paying, and government has took a different uh, route to reconcile this loss, just to uh, raising the prices of the electricity. And that, that a serious uh, financial and, and economic cost of the uh, general people. But government did it in February just to reconcile that's lost. But we are saying just stop it. Just stop it. Uh, shutting down some of the unnecessary power plants and some old ones. Stop paying so called capacity charges and revisit the illegitimate contracts with the IPP owners thereby saving some money to finance the social sector. That essentially, that, that, that seriously, uh, those are serious considerations for now. And the priority for this year is basically, the first one would be social security, the second one would be health, third one agriculture, and fourth would be various forms of subsidies and incentives. But interestingly, most of the incentives are going to the reach and the half the businessmen. This is one of the critics that each and everyone is making right at this moment. And we are asking to revisit all ongoing development projects to cut expenditure deemed unnecessary. Because there are many development projects that have the you know, line items, so many line items and budget put against those line items. Those are completely unnecessary. You will see in many cases that bureaucrats who'd be running, who'd be implementing this, those projects. They are going to Europe just to see how, how European farmers are uh, 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 growing potato. This is stupid. But this, some of the, you know, like uh, we call it pleasure trip are, are, are associated with this, some of these projects. So we are asking just cut down those expenditure drastically. And the next point is just to stop implementing unnecessary and extravagant development projects to save public money. Now government is implementing around 1500 different development projects uh, this year. Some are more, there are many projects that don't need it. Even there are many projects that could be implemented half with the half, half of the costs. So we are asking some of the, uh, some of the projects that must be stopped, uh, terming those unnecessary. And there are a lot of extravagant problems for uh, projects that we don't need it. Uh, uh, I'm not get, getting deep into that because there are a lot of uh, plenty of uh, examples. And the next point is we got to explore some opportunities to contract unconditional soft loans. I'm putting it quote unquote soft loans because soft loan has different implications to different organizations. So soft loans from the multilateral and bilateral development partners. So these are some of the immediate tasks that our government should pay attention to. Uh, and there are, I have put just two, two uh, important medium and long-term um, uh, uh, recommendations. As far as the energy policy is concerned, we must revisit and make necessary changes in the energy policy. That's the proxy energy policies like hot sector master plan uh, accepted in 2016. So it should be revisited and make changes in the light of our national interest because so many national interests are compromised with the, uh, with the uh, business groups and we have to consider the environmental considerations. So these environmental considerations mean so much to the people who are working for the energy sector especially on the coal. The second point is the so-called growth-led development model that we are beating the dams for must be replaced by the sustainable one, putting people before the profit. And thank you. Thank you, Manorda. So you gave a clear overview of external debt in Bangladesh and the power sector and put up very clear priorities and demands. Thank you. You crossed your time, but uh, we gave you that five minute extra because you oh, were really? cross. Yes. I'm sorry. 15 minutes. Why, didn't you, why didn't you ring the bell? Well, there was no bell to ring. <laughs> but next time. <laughs>
<laughs> so um, we'll, uh, without further ado, I think we'll go into um, listening to our speakers right away and we'll listen to Yuki Tanabe of Jaxis. Yuki. Yuki, uh, please put on your uh, video and your mic. Yes. And everyone, of course, keep your video and mic off and please put your questions in the chat box. Thank you. Yes. Oh, uh, yeah, my name is Yuki Tanabe. I work for a Japanese NGO called JAXIS. Uh, we are uh, trying to stop the coal power project, Matarbari coal power project in Bangladesh, because that, uh, the project is funded by Japanese government institutions, JICA. And uh, JICA has already provided the money for the phase one, pro one of the coal power project. And the JICA is now considering to provide a second, the phase two project also. Uh, the phase one project is uh, is around uh, uh, 700 billion yen. It's around uh, 7 billion US dollar project. Uh, and uh, within that uh, 5 billion US dollar loan uh, will be provided by Japanese government uh, through the ODA loan. Uh, which is the largest uh, amount of the ODA loan for one project in the in the Japanese history. So that is already yeah the uh, the construction has already uh, yeah uh, started uh, several years ago, and uh, will be uh, the operation will be started in 2024. And phase two, unit three and four the similar size of the phase one uh, is under a consideration uh, for technical assistance for feasibility study uh, by Japanese government. Uh, the, the amount is, is like a similar amount loan will be provided uh, for the phase two project. Uh, we are watching the uh, issue mainly uh, through the climate and the human rights issue, but the, today I'm going to explain about the economic aspect of the project. So the first issue is a cost economic uh, comparison between the renewable and uh, <coughs> coal power project. Uh, Carbon Tracker uh, recently published a good report uh, com this is the analysis, comparison analysis between the uh, renewable and the coal power in yeah, the many of, many of countries. And the Bangladesh has already, uh, that renewable is cheaper than coal. Uh, this is the another analysis by uh, the university uh, professor. And uh, the solar has already cheaper than coal in Bangladesh. And especially for Matarbari project, because the uh, Matarbari uh, will be built on the long, long flat beach. And they need uh, to build a, a, a port, deep sea port, uh, along the coal power plant. So that's why the, uh, the cost is very high. Uh, the, yeah, maybe highest in the uh, Bangladesh coal power plant. And the uh, second issue is uh, uh, overcapacity issue. Uh, the government, the Bangladesh government already estimated the uh, reserve margin uh, will be 69% uh, uh, maximum. And uh, the total, the uh, reserve margin, actual reserve margin will be uh, uh, high, higher than the uh, projected reserve margin uh, in the next 20 years. The US think tank AIFA uh, published, also published a similar analysis recently. And they also estimated the, uh, the similar amount, the large, similar uh, reserve margin will be uh, happened in the Bangladesh. 
and this uh, problem caused the uh, the budget uh, economic budget issue of the Bangladesh Power Development Board. So the recently uh, the sub the government provided the subsidies for the but. Bangladesh Power Development Board, and recently the uh, the amount of the uh, budget support uh, has been uh, double. Uh, so this is uh, due to the overcapacity issue. In addition to the over the uh, capacity issue, the COVID nineteen will be a uh, uh, additional uh, problem. Uh, on the uh, on this issue, and uh, uh, this is a gap between the a gap of the ge power generation uh, between the last year and this year at the same time, and uh, uh, recently the uh, the twenty around the twenty percent reduction uh, were already happened, so that would be a, a additional serious problem for the. Uh, the Bangladesh energy uh, economy. So IMF uh, estimated the GDP this year is only 2%. Uh, also the inflation rate is 5.5. Uh, uh, 5. So this is a very serious uh, because the, yeah, uh, the, the power project are funded by the foreign donors. So the Bangladesh has to pay uh, the, le the uh, interest and uh, uh, of the loan. So that the economic situation uh, is a very serious. So we are targeting uh, the Japanese government to uh, stop the, uh, the new uh, JICA loan for the phase two. Uh, because the, this is a this is a timing that uh, the government is now uh, considering to uh, provide a technical assistance for the phase two project. So we have already uh, yeah done a lot, and we published we have already published uh, uh, five reasons why government Japan should not support Matabari phase two project. So please, yeah, check the uh, fact sheet, and if you if you can, you yeah, please send your awareness to the uh, embassy of Japan in Bangladesh. So because they publish the contact email address on their website, so yeah, please, yeah, uh, send your message to and share and share your social media on this issue. Thank you very much. Thanks, Yuki. Uh, you kept good time. And now we'll go right over to Nora. Nora from Olgewald, who's a sinologist. Hello, everybody. It's, it's really a pleasure to be invited here. Um, and um, Mehidi um, asked me to start with my first visit to, to Bangladesh, which was uh, back in 84, uh, when I uh, visited Bangladesh the first time and I really have very good memories staying there at the Purbari International Hotel. Uh, unfortunately, it was um, after Indira Gandhi um, was assassinated. <laughs> but I still keep very good memories on Bangladesh. And um, Mehidi and me, we both um, have been part of this uh, very nice conference we organized last year on China as a creditor, where we really tackled the question of Chinese loans, especially also to Bangladesh. And um, we um, discussed the upcoming new debt crisis, uh, global debt crisis, um, and especially the investments along the Belt and Road uh, initiatives um, from mainly as dear by China. So uh, we also asked the question how necessary, to, how necessary it is for each country taking loans to develop its own national strategy, how to deal with China and Chinese loans. 
and especially if it's fitting in the national develop, uh, development plan. So today I, it will be more a kind of roll call from my side, um, mainly tackling uh, the energy investments in uh, Bangladesh uh, embedded in the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and in the end, I will say only two words on the new uh, National People's Congress, which, which ju just convened and just resumed last week. So Bangladesh is situated uh, in the middle of this uh, BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, so it has, um, is part of the Belt and Road, so part of the Land and Seaside Economic Corridor. Talking about economic corridors, these are uh, an important aspect of a uh, Chinese development model. The Bangladesh-China-India-Myanmar corridor is one of six corridors uh, and is um, always overshadowed by the conflict between India and China. This is why India wants to predate um, the BCIM corridor and always says it's based on the so-called Kunming initiative, which was established in 1999. Um, still, all these governments, India and Bangladesh uh, government, are very much interested in upholding cooperation. They just um, proclaimed last year in June, again, strong cooperation, especially, especially on the, in, the re in the fields of road connection, waterways, aviation, and also energy to enhance the regional competitiveness. I now just want to um, discuss very shortly this kind of narrative which is connected with Belt and Road, at, at which uh, China always advertises advertises globally um, and then come to the coal investments because the Belt and Road Initiative is, is, um, is a very clever term or is referring to the modern Silk Road um, which is always associated with innovation, adventure, openness and also the maritime Silk Road is referring to the ancient uh, ideal vision of trade, openness, um, and tries to trigger this imagination of a win-win Silk Road. Uh, so the official narrative is to create a new golden age of globalization and to create something like a kind of alternative um, globalization to the US dominated fossil fuel based globalization. So this vision, um, uh, is highly questionable, I think, because that would first of all need to have, need a rule of law environment in each of these countries to ensure the voices of the communities to be heard. Also, uh, for having a, a harmonious cooperation, it needs uh, to have a common reference system which is formed by all stakeholders, including local communities, based on free access to information. So what needs to be avoided are kind of white elephants, we are talking about that today, um, meaning indebtedness of um, the countries of Chinese investments, also finally leading to impoverishment of the people. What also needs to be avoided um, is destroying the planet by building coal power plants. And SGI, uh, the Global Environmental Institute and Service-Oriented NGO in China, um, stated or, or um, uh, published a study, uh, shows that China is involved in 240 coal power pro projects along the Belt and Road. Um, China's own development is really based on coal. So for decades, China was investing in coal to uh, trigger their economic development. But at the same time, China is the biggest um, exporter of innovative 
uh, of um, of um, renewable energies. So what we see here on the right side uh, is the development of wind energy in um, in China. Um, and also, this is a wind park in Xinjiang, which is simultaneously the same place where they will now build the biggest coal power plant in the world. So this is very contradictory um, <clears throat> policy. And what is China doing now in Bangladesh? I just skipped that. I hear there is some voice in the background. Um, is just exporting their development model. Um, we have to take China by their promise and also all the other countries by their promise because uh, in 2017 in May, there was the Belt and Road Forum for International Cooperation. And there, 29 head of states signed an agreement that they will uh, engaged in the Belt and Road um, according to the Paris Alignment. Bangladesh, we can see here on this map, is on position seven uh, for Chinese built projects, Chinese coal fire, uh, coal fired power uh, projects, um, and Indonesia even is on position two. All this is because um what is offered by china is simply the cheapest available source of power and that's why it is chosen um just recently there was a study um by a e e r on the china uh, coal investments in indonesia um and this study also shows that the low quality of these plans caused wasteful investment in the coal sector, uh, which failed also to produce the expected amount of electricity. Um, this is a slide from Mehidi, which shows that uh, of all coal power plants which are planned in, in Bangladesh, 13 are financed by China. Um, a few days ago, we published a press release um, because the National People's Congress uh, just convened in Beijing, uh, which will start to discuss the next five-year plan of China, which will have very yeah, major implications on climate change. Urgewald's uh, research just found that six, 26 projects which are developed in Bangladesh in the uh, framework of the coal power plants are developed with Chinese utilities and engineering companies. Among them is the Pyra Hub uh, project in Bangladesh, uh, situated in the Sundarbans. Um, once operational the hub and the connected port will be used to import 20 million metric tons of coal each year. So the hub will supply at least four power plants which imported coal from Indonesia. Uh, Chinese engineering companies are involved in the construction in all of them. And the power plants are all co-owned by the Chinese government. So this is where we have to direct our requests. The construction of the Pyra port and the resulting traffic uh, will destroy large parts of the Sundarbans. China has pumped more money into Bangladesh than any other country over the past couple of years. China saw, uh, uh, Bangladesh saw a record of inflow in FDI in 2018. Uh, well, uh, what is the name? Monover talked about that already. Um, and out of the $3.6 billion uh, FDI, one third um, is given by China. What is even worse is that it's planned to import hydropower to Bangladesh um, 
because it's even cheaper. Um, so just uh, my last words on the NPC just resumed in China. Uh, the NPC announced that uh, the debt policy, um, an important pillar of the Chinese national uh, economy, and China will start to discuss bilaterally about arrangements of debt restructuring and cancellation. And one important other uh, outcome is um, that the Belt and Road Initiative should be more beneficial for all the partner countries. So we have to press also our European governments to uh, put much more pressure on <laughs> Uh, on China and the collaboration um, to uh, hold China by its promises. So I will stop here. Thank you, Nora. And um, I'll have to ask everyone's permission that we continue this at least 15 minutes more because we had said that we would start Bangladesh time five o'clock and end at 6.15. But can we go on till 6.30? Um, there is something uh, called uh, reactions at the bottom of your screen. You can, uh, you know, just like an FB, when you put a like, you can sort of put thumbs up or a clap. Um, meanwhile, our chat box is getting very busy, which is very good, but we will have the open uh, discussion. And I'll give the floor to Ryan Hassan who has clapped for the idea of giving himself and everyone else a little more time. The, the yes. <laughs> Executive Director of NGO Forum on ADB. Just give me a few seconds. Let me line this up. Uh, Done. Siddharth, you're going to get no seconds. You're just going to begin when your time will start. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. All right, so I'll just get started. Um, I titled it Bangladesh Debt Crisis, Choking to Death in the Time of COVID-19. A bit of irony, you know, we're choking for a respiratory disease, we're choking out of debt, we're choking out of pollution, so it seemed appropriate. So the lockdowns were enforced on March 26. Um, 13 million people went out of work with no fallbacks. It's a country of 170 million people, so high population density. And Bangladesh is considered the 14th most corrupt among 180 nations surveyed by Transparency International. So all my previous speakers, when they're talking about projects and financing and economy, it's good to for the audience to bear that in mind that the financial system is very, very corrupted, and it has been so for over two decades. So getting right development outcomes has always been a challenge. Where we are globally in terms of debt, as of September 2019, the global debt stands at $263 trillion. It's being considered the fourth wave of debt. Uh, the first wave was in the 70s in um, Mexico and then the Latin American debt and then you had uh, the debt, the rise in global debt before the financial crisis of 2008. Um, and now at 2010, it is being called the fourth wave of debt and it has never been this high ever in the history of the world, uh, which basically points to 7.7 .7 billion people leading down to each individual having a $32,500 of debt on their shoulders. And what that means for an individual in Bangladesh who's um, a wage laborer means that they have to do multiple, multiple jobs just to make ends meet, just to afford food, just to afford rent, just to afford health care. And we are pushed into this gig economy reality for the vulnerable and the poor, not only for Bangladesh, but I think for all people in the world. Uh, who are not, who are struggling with the breadbasket. So, and I would recommend this reading. It's a, it's a World Bank report which just came out on uh, global waves of debt. It's available on PDF um, if you do a Google search around it. Uh, the presentations with uh, Bangladesh Working Group. So if you guys email them for sources, they'll, uh, I give them permission to pass them on to you. 
coming back to the country, external debt in Bangladesh has increased to $37 billion as of 2019 from 33 billion as of 2018. And this is both public and private debt combined together. And if you look at the graph, uh, just, just, just look at 2018 and 2019, and you see that exponential rise in the trend of global debt. And 2020 is that big mix up year that we're all in. Um, lockdowns, revenue generating, garment sector is shut down. Uh, it is, this, this figure is expected to rise. So what does this all mean in terms of real health care delivery? I think this statement says it all. This is how far off we are in terms of reaching our people with what they need. There is 0.8 hospital beds for every 1,000 people in my country. And this is a staggering fact. And I want you all to bear in mind that this is the, this is the reality over which uh, we are talking about the debt crisis. So, this is a scary little thing I put together. Uh, ADB Active Projects from 2017 to 2020 uh, in Bangladesh. I don't expect you to read all of that. The reason why I put it there in this format is just to give you the vivid scale of the number of projects which are operating and the government has taken on these loans. So these include um, grid expansion, Dhaka Mass Rapid Transit Development Projects. If you just let your eyes rest on it, you will see different kinds of projects popping up at you. And most of them are in the transport and energy sector and a splatter of agricultural projects. And it doesn't end there. So as Monoir was pointing out to the international loans that we have taken on and the sheer bulk size of it, and this is just 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020. And that gives you a scale of ADB's grip inside the country from 1973 till 2020. A full list of this is available. I can provide it to you. If anybody wants to look at each project more carefully, feel free to reach out to NGO Forum on ADB. So uh, what has been ADB's experience in Bangladesh, at least from civil society point of view, We've seen development projects in Chokoria, Cogs Bazar, destroying forest land and leading to high salinity for incidents of very harmful shrimp cultivation. We've seen um, rice farmers, small scale farmers wiped out in the name of crop diversification for cash crops, eventually leading to high valuation of land in private hands. Uh, we've seen atrocious human rights abuses of Garo communities in Modupur because of ADB projects. We've seen over 2 million people displaced in Kulna Joshua drainage rehabilitation project back in the 90s. So the experience has been super, super bitter. And well, a lot of you have uh, previous speakers are pointing towards investments in the energy sector and ADB has not let that go. They've been very active in the Bangladesh energy sector for quite a while. And one of the most pivotal roles that they have played is privatizing and reforming the Bangladesh laws around energy in order for multinational corporations to come in. And this was no, uh, more evident in the Fulbari movement and ADB's pivotal role in moving the government from away from BAPEX and Petrobangla and moving more towards multinational corporations for that particular project. Obviously there was a social movement and a resistance and ADB pulled out. Um, so the way in which ADB has played around with the Bangladesh economy has been through technical assistance policy loans, which basically reform laws. Uh, it, it has coerced Bangladesh governments, uh, Bangladesh Bank with structural adjustment programs. It does direct lending to the government for standalone projects. And it also does a lot of private sector led operations through its non-sovereign lending arm. So where was ADB in health infrastructure? And this is a loan which is approved, I think last month, and it's a big one. It's a $500 million loan to bolster the efforts of the government to manage the impact of the novel coronavirus. And once you go to the ADB website for this particular loan, there's this beautiful paragraph. I mean, it resonates with so much of goodwill. The loan is expected to benefit 15 million people, poor and vulnerable, 
in Bangladesh. 1.5 million workers, mostly women, in export-oriented industries will receive extended salary support, yada, yada, yada. Um, the government social protection programs will be bolstered up for old age people. Uh, it will reach 100 of the poorest local governments. I mean, this is like a dream come true for $500 billion. But then you've got to ask yourself, since 1973, where the hell were you all these years? And in answer to that question, and this is in the ADB country profile for Bangladesh, if you look at the red bar, that's all the projects which ADB has funded, rounding up to $24 billion, that's 772 projects. The most intensive sector has been energy with 119 projects and transport another 119. But I want you guys to look at the last bar, which is health. And the number of health projects over the last 30 years of operations was only 31. And the total amount of money spent in investing in health in Bangladesh by the Asian Development Bank is only $388.76 million. And if you looked at the previous slide, the COVID-19 response alone is $500 million, which shows you the scale of ADB's interest in the health sector of this country, especially the public health sector. Going back to that idea that 0.8 hospital beds are available for a thousand people. Now coming to the AIIB in Bangladesh, and I was just looking at um, projects specifically approved post 2016 till 2019. Most of them has been looking at distribution uh, at uh, it's a it's a gasification of the country. So you you're looking at system upgrades, electricity grid upgrades, but mostly for a gas infrastructure power generation system. So the standalone project, which we have monitored very closely with CLEAN and the Bangladesh Working Group, the Bhola IPP, um, was a $60 million investment in 2018. Uh, then you're looking at a lot of road projects. Um, the ones which were approved in 2018 are actually smaller loans, just to scope whether these roads are feasible. I want you to dwell on the Silet to Tamabil Road upgradation, upgradation project 2018. And I want, to, I want you guys to bear in mind the map which Nora showed of the Belgian road, which cuts through Bangladesh. And um, it's very, very interesting. And I'll come, to, I'll come to that in a bit. The first one is a COVID-19 active response expenditure uh, support program, CARES, which is $250 million. It's co-financed with the ADB loan of 500 million. So specifically from these two regional development banks, you're looking at $750 million. And I'm sure there's some World Bank assistance coming in for that as well. Then you have another project, which is co-financed, $250 million on Dhaka sanitation. And then the big ticket one is the Silet Tawambil Road upgrade project for $404 million, which was approved last month. Now this road directly fits into the Belgian Road Initiative. And this project has been approved behind closed doors in a time when nobody knows what the project design is. I, I doubt if the negotiations were done in an equitable manner for the Bangladesh government to understand the geopolitical ramifications of this road project. So coming back to Bangladesh debt servicing realities, in the current fiscal year, 2020, the government has kept aside one point. $85 billion for external debt servicing. And this was, uh, obviously it's an increased number from last year, which was $1.2 billion in principal and $570 million in interest. And this is the ERD, our Economic Relations Division, uh, their figures that uh, currently we are looking at $845 million from the current year to be used for debt servicing. It is being expected that by 2020, the Bangladesh Overall debt will rise to over $40 billion. Very, very scary. And to this end, IMF responded. And IMF came in, uh, as uh, Mehdi Bai's slide showed in the beginning, with a $732 million emergency assistance fund straight aimed at the Bangladesh Bank to keep it from sinking completely. And according to the IMF, um, it, 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 the, the tone of the messaging is positive, but do look at the fine print. According to the IMF, once the crisis abates, that is the COVID-19 crisis, the authorities are committed to refocus on addressing banking sector problems. So we have deep banking sector problems, including non-performing loans. 
can we have 10 minutes of discussion? So I'll um, right away, I'll ask Monoar Da to respond to the first question that came from Donna Marie. Um, is there a force majeure clause in the power purchase agreement such as such that the government of Bangladesh can invoke it due to COVID-19 and stop making capacity payments? Is it possible to acquire copies of power purchase agreements in order to identify legal opportunities? It's very, yes, difficult. No. It's very difficult because mm -hmm. it's not public document at all. And I have been talking to one of the senior government officials the other day. Even he was thinking about paying attention to this particular case, meaning uh, in whether there is an opportunity to invoke some of the provisions uh, just to reconcile the laws during this, during this period. But even he was not sanguine about whether it could be evoked or not. So what he was saying that he want, he intends to leave the issue to legal uh, professionals just to inquire about it. And uh, in his mind, what was general public who would do it. So in fact, he was, ask, he was asking the government to do it. Uh, but we know that if there is no voices on the state, government will not do anything. It's our responsibility to get that piece out in one way or another. Uh, then we'll raise our voice, but you can't get it. Uh, you can't get it uh, in a straight way. Um, there was Zakir Hussain Khan had a question for everyone. What would be the immediate strategy of CSOs uh, to create effective demand for open information policy? Something, you know, reflective of what Monorda was saying. While we are observing the reverse across countries, including the so-called land of democracy. I'm sorry, I'm not opening this up for people who put those questions to actually question because it usually takes a little more time. Yes. Anyone wants to go with that? Answer that. Um, immediate strategy is, at least from the Bangladesh point of view, there should be a sustained effort towards debt cancellation. Uh, and that should be made to multiple creditors uh, periodically. The other, uh, the other aspect which really needs to be looked at is when international finance is coming into the Bangladesh government under the COVID response, to look at the financial architecture of that particular uh, system through which these loans are going to be distributed. If there is going to be an emphasis that the loans are conditions towards privatization and private sector reform, now would be the time to really demand the government to address public health using public health systems and looking at public health investment. Uh, and this is something where civil society really has to carefully map out the strategy because I'm fully aware of our Digital Surveillance Act and the risks involved, but asking the questions as to what's happening in Ministry of Health, Ministry of Social Welfare, what projects, how many districts, how will the money go? I think that is a positive politics conversation which we should all start getting in. A related question, I guess, from Tilak to everyone was, uh, can't you use the Right to Information Act of Bangladesh? Um, can someone answer that? I know or, or Ryan or Mehdi from Bangladesh. Meanwhile, for um, Nora and Yuki, there's another question. Is there an analysis of Japanese and Chinese power tech loans to Bangladesh? Anyone can go. You know, as far as the Right to Information Act is concerned, there are some provisions associated with it that doesn't permit some of the information. Government is not bound to disclose those information, particularly that has some, you know, secrecy on the state or that uh, potentially damage the uh, image of some organizations. And as far as I know, information falls into that category as I have been talking to some of the journalists the other day. They would not disclose it. Okay. And uh, the analysis of Japanese and Chinese power sector loans to Bangladesh, does anyone have an answer? Nora, Yuki? 
Yeah, well, um, Uga Wild, together with their partners, are doing public and private sector loans um, coming from China, but not specifically on Bangladesh. So Bangladesh is included, but uh, as far as I know, um, there's no study focusing specifically on Bangladesh. Okay. Okay. Um, Zakir has a question to, no, Amanur Rahman, sorry, has a question for Ryan. What is the external debt servicing status per annum in comparison to GDP? And do you see this as alarming while comparing it with domestic borrowing? Well, I don't have the figures on me right now. And I actually tried uh, going through the web for the last two days just to find out the exact debt servicing charge that the government is doing with specific to ADP and specific to AIB. But a lot of that information is just hard to come by. But you can, uh, I think the knee jerk reaction to that question would possibly be that our debt servicing payments would be a significant amount of our annual GDP. Uh, comparing to the Philippines, which is like 18% of the annual GDP goes into debt servicing. The Bangladesh uh, GDP, according to trade economics, Bangladesh Bank is going to rise to 33% of the annual GDP into debt servicing loans. But if you want to deconstruct that 33% as to how much will be going to bilateral banks and how much will go to IFIs, I'm afraid we don't have that transparency of information. Okay. Um, well, I'll put this to Mehdi from Zakir Hussain Khan. Uh, Mehdi, you're not going to get your last five minutes of closing remarks, so you can close with this, but we'll continue with questions. Can the Bangladesh Working Group on External Debt take the lead to file a writ petition against the speedy power generation and supply in 2010 to scrap it? Very good, that uh, Zakir Bhai, thank you. It's a question from Bangladeshi colleagues, so so uh, you know uh, answer is very easy uh, we are trying to uh, you know uh, we already discussed several time with uh, uh, some of our uh, friends in uh, supreme court including jotir maida jotir maida is here so later we also can sit in bangladesh working group and uh, 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 talk to jotir maida and other other um, uh, other advocates uh, lawyers in supreme court uh, so that whether we can go with it or not uh, it should be we should take uh, you know opinion from them uh, about the possibility about the you know uh, it's called achievable whether it is achievable okay that's all thank you okay um you uh okay Zakir Hussain, ATM Zakir Hussain, to all, is it possible that people's advocates become stronger than lobbyists of business to influence the power sector policy, especially in Bangladesh? Well, that's an aspirational question, but anyone wants to answer that? Uh, it's really a bit tricky in, in, in terms of um, the, you know, the past 13 years of continuous uh, uh, in just holding the power by the current uh, political elites. Um, that, that, but what I understand is that um, possibly there is a still gaps in uh, coordinated efforts of the civil society in terms of have a long term, you know, uh, the holistic plan, how could all uh, uh, demand could be massed together to create a very much, you know, effective pressures upon the governments. So I believe that people, uh, whenever uh, they need demand uh, of the people, demand has been merged with the political, uh, you know, uh, ideology or political issue. That it's really uh, be very much tough to get uh, in the outcomes, especially government take it as anti-government issue rather than this really people and uh, uh, nature friend, uh, related issue. So my understanding is that I believe that there is still scope and uh, you know there is another platform live and uh, livelihood uh, nature uh, safeguard platform so this is also working to, uh, on the, the same things coal based anti coal power so my understanding is that we have an scope even in the government if, uh, there has influence in the supreme court i understand that there is a still challenge 
but what could we do is to bring it to the other form of the international. And why I just raised this question here, just to keep the people uh, in from that if we fail here, so keep it, uh, bring it to the international fora that uh, because there is a, uh, in 2016, there is a special um, uh, uh, provision has been created by the uh, International court, Criminal Court that any state sponsored uh, um, uh, efforts that would damage the uh, uh, for, uh, forest or uh, something ecological destruction. That is clearly indication of the uh, crime saying is the humanity. So these are the tools have been already in come up with and the Paris Agreement is there and other tools. So we have to think how could those all together be materialized to bring the outcomes uh, for the people and the nature as well. So sorry for just a little bit more uh, elaboration, but my understanding is this, we have to identify the holistic efforts. How could we just bring together all the uh, uh, efforts to get the outcomes? Thank you. So I think uh, it's, it's time to say thank you, everybody. And uh, I think it sh we should stop here.